Hello, hello, everybody. It's 9, 10 p.m. Central Time on the 12th of September, 2022. It's Monday here in the United States. Tuesday internationally. Hope you are doing well. We are here on the Earthquake 3D live stream to talk about a few earthquakes which have struck since my last update. And if you missed the last update, we were talking about the 76 very large earthquake that struck over here at Papua New Guinea on land and the expected activity, what we'd look for over the next few days, going out to the west and over to the far west, over to Europe and so forth. And let me just make sure that you can see this on the screen. And I'm apologizing really quick if it looks a little funky. Uh, I'm on a, again on my wife's computer trying to make this all work. It might not all fit on the screen like I expect, but uh, we're making do with what we have. So anyway, we have a big earthquake that struck about a day and a half, almost two days ago, over here on the West Pacific. Since then, here's everything that struck since the big earthquake. Let's get the big earthquake out of there. Right there. So since then, here is what has struck, going all the way out over to Europe and across over to Central and South America, which we're going to talk about all these, plus the United States, swarming on the West Coast, not just anywhere along the California-Nevada border, and down at Central California along the coast. But first, over here in the West Pacific, take a look at it. It's like a river branching out in two directions, one over to the west and another up to the north, following the arrows up across up into Japan, which is also getting hit with a huge typhoon right now, but up to the north, right along the coast of Japan, northeast Japan, all the way up into Hokkaido, three separate fives. If you take these and add them together, it equals mid-range five already. 5.2 plus 5.0 plus 5.0 equals about a 5.4 to 5.5. Now, also, a 5.7 to near 6 struck right at South Philippines, going right at the tip of the arrow. And these are on the plate boundaries, which I can open up here from the USGS and show you the plate boundary map if you're not familiar with it. You should probably try to remember it, but I'll show it a lot over my updates. You see the red lines here on the screen. The red lines, of course, are the plate boundaries, the boundaries between plates like the Indo-Australian plate, where it meets up with the Pacific, for instance, or where the Pacific meets up with the Juan de Fuca fracture zone or the United States, the San Andreas Fault. That's where the Pacific meets North America, Laurentia, the continent. But we're talking about over here, and it's flowing like a river at this point, going up to the north, to Japan, and over to the west, all the way out towards Iran. Now, if you watched my last update, you know that we were watching China and Iran. Not just anywhere in China. We were watching downstream from the previous 6.6, .6, and that's exactly what's happened. A new 5, 4.9. Struck north, just east of the Takalamakan Desert, where the arrow is. Here, just east, this new 5. Now, same time that broke out, around the same time. Two separate quakes struck in Iran four last night, and a five, or 4.8, plus a bunch of other activity, smaller aftershock activity. Now, I was looking right here at the divot in the plate, right here along the plate boundary. We are just north, but, I mean, there it is. Iran started to move today after it was quiet, high and dry, with no earthquake activity in my last video, which was two days ago. So, China started to move with a five. Iran started to move with a five. Now, you may compare to my last video where I warned for this, but we're warning for six. We are one magnitude under exactly about one magnitude under exactly about, right? There is no such thing. We are about one magnitude under what we're expecting so far. So if I'm looking for a six to 6.5 and instead we get a five, that's a magnitude under to a magnitude and a half. So it's not the full expected energy yet. This is day one to day two of something that should take about a week to take place. Same time that's going on, all the way on the far southwest side of the Indo-Australian plate, we have the exact same sized earthquake, another 4.9. But let me take you back over to the USGS plate boundary map here and show you really where we had two 4.9s. One up here in China, but USGS doesn't have any plate boundary up there, do they? The other 4.9 on the plate boundary down here, just southwest of the Indo-Australian plate, in the middle of the Indian Ocean. 
So two 4.9s on both sides of this, of the Indo-Australian plate. But how is the earthquake up in China connected? Take a look. There we go. Going up and around the bend of the plate, you see it. It's a dark brown color. This is the mountain ranges versus the highlands. This is the northern side of what I would just call the Himalayan range. Even though it's the Himalayas are down here, you see it. It goes up and around and then goes to the west over into western China. So 4.9 there and a 4.9 all the way down here means this whole region across the whole Indo-Australian plate going up as far north as the other, let's just call that a 4.9 or a 5, up in Iran. So let's go back and look one more time at the plate boundary map. What just moved 4.9 wise? See it now? All three sections tied together as this whole area is beginning to shift after the wave comes out from the West Pacific. It's not that the 7.6 is causing these. It's that the 7.6 and these are all being caused by a greater inundating wave that's spreading up to Japan and all the way over to Iran and all the way down to the Indian Ocean. What size struck up in Japan, guys? A 5, a 5.2, and another 5. Well, what's the difference between a 5 and a 4.9 and a 4.9? Now, let me point something else out. Yesterday, last night, the other 4.9 and the other 4.9, well, 4.8 now, the two other 4.9s which struck in between the previous 5s. Sure is a lot of 4.9 and going on. Now, Really, I would just call those all fives. And it's a series of fives spreading all the way out over to Iran and all the way up to Japan. I think they listed most of them as 4.9s because if average Joe saw a bunch of fives spread out across three quarters of the planet in the course of a day, they might actually start to wonder. But who even checks the 4.0 and greater feet? Everybody just has their thing set for five and greater and six and greater. And we're worried about what average Joe thinks. Now, speaking of average show and what they think, let's go over to the West, over into Europe, for instance. Check it out. Eastern Europe struck directly on the plate boundary. Well, the Craton Edge plate boundary that I call. Craton Edge for sure, 4.1 Romania. Coming up out of Greece. Now that's going to go around up to the north and go out to Iceland, where a new volcano has now been officially announced. I can't pronounce the name of it, but you can go look up the news on it. I'm just telling you about it. In the past couple days... I want to say start of September, they officially declared a new volcano in Iceland. That the eruptions in Iceland are from a new volcano that has formed down here, not tied to the previous. Now, I don't know how we could even determine that on our own, but they were talking about the angle of the fissuring that was happening along the peninsula somewhere down here. And that the new volcano formed in a new angle, very steep to the north, where these are all going at like 60 degrees to the north, and it's going at 79 to 80 degrees to the north. And I don't know exactly where it is. I want to say it's somewhere right in between these two. They thought it was related to one, but it, now it turns out it's its own volcano, a new volcano. They now have 35 volcanoes in Iceland, according to the news articles that came out on this. So that's a big deal, right? Well, we saw the seismic come in before that. The flow that causes the eruptions. The seismic flow is some kind of very low frequency, ultra low frequency, extremely low frequency, I don't know which, but it definitely is traveling through the plate boundaries, this wave that I'm talking about, and it's following the plate boundaries as though they are wave guides, guiding the wave, like a tank almost. So, let's recap. Let's start back over in the West Pacific. Who got hit? Well, we saw the flow go out over to the West, undeniable, and up to the North, undeniable. And we're dealing with Japan, Iran, and China, and the Western side of the Indo-Australian plate. Meanwhile, deep earthquakes, a series of new deep earthquakes, all around our letter D here, right at the Northeast side of the Indo-Australian plate, or the Far East side of the Indo-Australian plate right over here at this triangular shaped bend. So that's all going on down below the plate. Something else is coming up now. 
as I'm recording this video in the past few hours, new deep earthquakes, going up into the five range. Whenever I see deep earthquakes in the five range, I know pretty much to expect next to the deep earthquakes, shallower, larger earthquakes that get about a magnitude larger just when there's one deep five. With multiple deep fives and deep fours, this would mean we need to watch just north of New Zealand for the potential of a large earthquake going up above six, 6.5, maybe even bigger. We're dealing with sevens around the, the plate right now, so I mean, we could even be toying around with the potential of a seven, but I'll leave it at six. We're going to look to 6 to 6.5 in the Kermadec Islands next to this deep earthquake. Across, over, look. Look which direction our arrow points and look what's going on down here now. Well, when I did my update two days ago, we just had a few small earthquakes down here. Not very many at all. But now we're dealing with a whole spread of the same size, all in the mid to upper four range. Take a look at this. So it's like a shield of earthquakes spread out across or a crescent of earthquakes spread across what spread across this going across South America's coast back up the plate boundary back over to the west where our arrow points across to now look what's going up on the north side same thing same size 4.4 4.5 4.6 and then down here 4.2 what's going on down south 4.6, 4.5, 4.2, 4.5. So it's both sides are moving on the same basis right now. And the leverage is coming from over here and it's spreading across. And I say leverage, I really mean a wave. A wave is splitting and going across. And how is it splitting? Well, it's coming across, I think, as far as the fracture zone. And I say I think because we can't detect it yet. I've got a post on my members page over on my YouTube page. Listen up, guys. I've got a membership thing over on my YouTube page. You can become a member, a paying member. See my private posts. So, well, private to the membership. And we were talking about this. I came up with an invention idea that could potentially detect this wave. Anyway, posted that on the membership if you guys want to go check it out. But the wave is certainly coming across from over here, and it spreads, and it goes out over to the east following the plate boundary. And that's the path the earthquakes take. So what's going on across up to the north? Well, Japan started to move, of course. China started to move, like I said, by 4.95 and a 5 and a 5. Over to the east, one magnitude less so far. So if we're one magnitude less across the board so far on day two of this, we have about five more days to go. And I think we're going to go up. I really do. I, I don't think it's going to be going away with the new deep earthquake activity that's taking place. Same with South America. We're going to go a whole step up from where we are now. If we're upper mid to upper fours, we're going to mid to upper fives. Now, I have a warning going here on the coast of Chile for the potential of a seven. And that's based upon the seven on the opposite side of the plate. And we see a back and forth which happens sometimes when there's a big amount of movement in the West Pacific, the East Pacific and beyond, one plate beyond, starts to compensate. So that's why the warning is still going down in Chile. What else happened? Well, United States. Let's get into that. Alaska, U.S. First of all, Alaska, you're one magnitude under. I'm expecting you to go up a full magnitude from here and beyond in the next few days. And the spot we're watching Let's look down between the current sets of earthquakes. Let's get all those small earthquakes on here. Oh, 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 hold on one second, guys. Guys, I'm not live, but I'm not live, but I had to unplug the microphone so I could sneeze really quick. Okay, I could just edit that out, but I'm just not going to process the video. I'm recording this somewhat live. At least I'm talking live. Okay, so Alaska, where do we watch? We watch between our current sets of earthquakes, and then that just brings us right down in the middle of the hot mess, right here along the bay or inlet or harbor that comes in here to Anchorage. You see all the rings. You see where they overlap. We have a four out off the coast, and we have a spread going all the way up here to our oil pumping operations or right next to them, next to Prudhoe Bay. There's a bunch of oil pumping operations up here in case you didn't know. 
right here at the Arctic Circle. Now this is also the place up here where they had actually designed HARP, H-A-A-R-P, the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program, or project, but program, I think. Anyway, they had originally designed it to detect oil deposits down in the ground using very low frequency coming from the high frequency facility. And the way they did that or do that is to use high, high frequency pulsed up into the upper ionosphere, which then creates plasma in a very large sphere, which vibrates like a bass drum, and that creates VLF, which then is like used basically like radar. They can shoot it down in the ground and it reflects off and comes back up and goes back to harp. That was the original use designed by Bernard Eastland, who holds the patents on the process. Anyway, Prudhoe Bay up here to the west by northwest. I don't know exactly where it is, but we should be able to just kind of zoom in and see it once the images load here. Now, again, I'm using Starlink, I think. Hold on. Yeah, I'm on my surveillance satellite connection. Starlink should be going pretty fast. Don't know what's going on. It's like every time I get on Google Earth to show stuff, it starts to slow down and we don't get to show anything. And I'm not kidding. Okay, so here's Prudhoe Bay. We're going to sit here and wait till it loads because I want to show you what a Arctic oil pumping operation really looks like from up in well, aerial photography or up in space. So while we're waiting, let me just tell you a quick story about this location. I didn't know anything about it until a series of earthquakes started to strike next to it over the course of months. And finally, I, after being lazy and not looking it up for months, I decided to put the coordinates in and go see. And that's when you come into this and you see this from above and you see all these pads cleared. You might think it would be from mining. But then you find out Google took the Google car in here and you can actually go down at a street level and go in and see what Prudhoe Bay actually looks like. And hey, check it out. Look how quickly the ground uh, pictures load. Okay, proof that proof the location from above is being blocked, but the street level they didn't think to block because who would think to check for a street level in Alaska? Now it loads quick, right? Check it out. Point of censorship is over once it's already shown. All right, so we're at the operation. Well, we're right next to the operation where they do a bunch of drilling, and we're going all the way across Alaska. I want you to look at the earthquakes more like a ramp that we're jumping off the plate boundary coming out of the North Pacific and we go right up across Mount McKinley or Mount Denali, then we go up to your drill points. And this only happens when Alaska's being saturated with this seismic wave that I keep talking about in this update. So let me show you one more time. The red line, the red line of the plate boundary between Alaska and Laurentia, North America or I'm sorry, between the Pacific and Alaska, North America, Laurentia. And the earthquakes come right across, and then they jump off like a ramp up into the edge of the North American Craton. Craton, Craton. You like that? Okay. Get, get your attention. On the North American Craton. One more time. Hold on. Let me see if this is even showing. It, we should have a graphic on the screen right here. Okay. That is the North American Craton. Now, the craton moves. Notice, compare my diagram to the USGS plate boundary map. Notice anything? Well, first of all, USGS doesn't have anything going across the United States at all. We have big black arrows showing you where to look. Now, the earthquakes follow the edge of the craton. So just remember that. And the edge of the craton, which I'm talking about, is the rusty brownish color here. So that orangish, rusty, brownish color, the interior portion of the craton, the most stable or the strongest part of the plate, and the earthquakes go around it. And it's not even up for debate. So there used to be people who told me that, you know, it was chance or coincidence. I even got accused of faking the earthquakes to make it look like there was a flow going across the North American craton. Well, it all goes back up to Alaska, where it's coming from. So first, the energy jumps off up into the northwest edge of the North American Graton. Then it flows down across into the United States along the plate boundary and the Graton edge. Plate boundary is the red line that I've been showing you the whole update. 
the San Andreas, for instance. But interior, again, USGS has jack squat. Meanwhile, the earthquakes come in, go over, go down and around through Texas, and back up the East Coast. Following this. So it's indisputable now. I mean, again, I, I tried to show this to professionals like 10 years ago. They said I was faking it. They said it was a chance of coincidence first, and then they said I was faking it. Well, now here we are. I did the live stream for six years for everyone in the world to see that A, I wasn't faking earthquakes, and B, there is a progression that goes across the plates and the cratons. See, the, the plates absorb the energy from those red lines. Let's go back over to the map one more time. West Coast. The plate, North America, absorbs the seismic wave, and then it takes it in and across following the craton. That's one of my biggest discoveries, by the way, that energy flows across cratons from one direction to another on a weekly basis. I mean, that's the kind of like the principle for earthquake forecasting is that there's a trajectory to the way the earthquakes flow and that the earthquakes are caused by something else that's flowing through there, that the earthquakes aren't causing one another, that there's a flow that's going across and it's causing the earthquakes. And then the spacing kind of tells us very low frequency, ultra low frequency, hundreds to thousands of miles apart between peaks. So speaking of hundreds to thousands of miles apart between peaks, what happened on the West Coast? Let's go look up the earthquakes, go see what's going on. We'll start up here in the Northwest, up in Washington State, since they only have a handful of earthquakes reported in the past day. The earthquakes which are reported, a majority of them, are both right next to volcanoes down to the south. Now if we go look up the earthquakes, like for instance this 0 or this 0 0.3, should bring us in right next to one of the most famous volcanoes on the planet, north northeast of Amboy, Washington. This is Mount St. Helens. But a picture speaks a thousand words, so let's put the coordinates in. Now, don't worry. It's not going to erupt. We're not looking at any eruptive activity. Well, uh, it's not going to erupt now. We'll know if it's going to erupt when there's just thousands of small earthquakes happening inside of this crater. But right now, no worries. Right now, we're on the edge of the dome, which sooner or later will load. Edge of the dome. There it is, inside the crater. No big deal. It's small earthquake activity. The magma chamber starts to get a little perturbed as this vibrating wave arrives. Very low frequency. When the peaks are coming up, it's going out through the magma chamber, causes a little activity, and then it spreads east. Now, up to the north, this other brown splotch we're on the side or the flank of Mount Rainier. Previously, we we're right below the crater. So again, nothing to worry about here, but they do have it just listed as Washington. Hmm, interesting. It's a very nondescript way to list an earthquake. Let's go see what's there. The only way to know is to find out, to look, see. Packwood, Washington, ah. Well, I'm seeing a bunch of squares and blotches. That must be what's on the ground. It's the year 1995. Don't have access to the internet, but a modem or something. Oh, wait, I am on Starlink. I'm going to do a speed test again. This is getting ridiculous. What's this? I There's no way to know because the images won't load. Here's our earthquake epicenter. Is there anything else here nearby that we need to know about? My goodness. Really starting to wonder now. Is there something here I'm not supposed to see? What am I missing? What is this place? Looks like some kind of training center, it says. Solo championship something or other. We have homesteads. 1896 homesteads. What do you have, like some kind of Tartarian star for here that I'm just missing? Could be true. Okay, all right. We're in between two volcanoes. We're right next to Goat Rocks. We're on the south side of Mount Rainier. Nothing to load. It's listed as Washington. Getting suspicious. I get suspicious when stuff like that starts to happen. Makes you wonder what, what's actually there. We're at Packwood State Park. I could tell you a quick story about something that I found, but it would blow your mind. I might need to upload a separate video on that. Um, on a giant feature I found down here in California that's 300 miles long. 
exactly 300 miles long, down to the mile. And it's a giant 300-mile-long star fort. Uh, there's no way. I, I don't know how ancient people could have built it. So it's 300 miles long. I mean, we're talking like like something like impressive is the Great Wall of China, you know, even though the Great Wall of China is thousands of miles long curving. This thing's 300 miles long, linear. Imagine a 300-mile-long wall anywhere. They can't even do that on the border now. Okay, so let's here and just go along the coast. We're following the San Andreas right here. Big swarm broke out at the geysers of California. So the geysers of California, Cobb, California, Clear Lake Volcano is the culprit. But humans have come in and drilled in to the side of this volcanic field to get steam. What humans do is they inject their sewage down into the ground. And then coming up out of the ground is steam from the evaporated water. And that's here at Clear Lake Volcano. We're zooming in on the side of the mountain here. We'll just show you what one of the geothermal pumping operations looks like if it'll load. There we go. So there are the turbines, and there's the apparatus, and of course we've got pipeline that goes out and away. And that's just one of them. There's dozens of the turbines across the hillside here. The volcanic field is Clear Lake, which you can feel free to pause it and read it when I click on this if you need to. It's from the Smithsonian. That all being said, swarm outbreak there means incoming flow. Now, if that was the only swarm, I'd say, ah, okay, look, this volcano gets hit a lot. There's a geothermal pumping operation there. But look at the diagonal line of earthquakes going along the coast. Do you see that? It goes down across the what's called the creeping section of the San Andreas next to Monterey Bay. And it dead ends right here at a place called Parkfield, California. But then we have one lone quake over here, jumping like, like it's a rail or something, or a road, and we're jumping off the road and going over into the valley. So a line of quakes comes down and then makes a hard east off the San Andreas. And this is a regular occurrence. And the biggest of the bunch, a mid-range three, striking on the creeping section of the San Andreas, proof that the creeping section is indeed creeping right now. And if that was the only thing going on, I'd say, ah, uh, look, creeping section of the San Andreas creeps all the time. But, you know, threes, look, it doesn't happen all the time. We might want to watch it for maybe some bigger down south or up north. But then you take into account the swarm up north. I already said that about the swarm up north. Well, if it was just not that, right? So now we got a swarm up north. We got the creeping section creeping on a three. We jump over into the valley. You want to see what's there? Want to see why we're jumping off the San Andreas? Colinga. Come on, everybody, say it with me. Colinga. Colinga. I got a creaking door and a cat coming in. Or is that a cat going out? Okay, let's go ahead and paste and search. Colinga. I guess I could turn off this volcano information. Take a look at the screen if it loads. If they've got guts, they'll load it. There we go. You're going to start to see a bunch of little pads carved out here into the ground. Now we go up and around and there's just thousands of these. This is an oil field that starts at Kolinga. They're not doing coal mining here. Kolinga gets its name from the old railroad days when they used to drop off coal in big shipments for the trains to pick back up for their ride back east since they didn't have coal mines going out here, apparently back in the time of Tartaria. So, and I'm not joking about that when I say Tartaria. Okay, so, drill points. Here's the San Andreas. You see it? Drill points start in earnest right about here. And I mean thousands of them. And we go right up to the San Andreas. So we come down the San Andreas, and guess where we jump off to? The drill points. And then they go in a diagonal line all the way down. All of this is drilled, by the way. Hundreds of thousands of times. And I'll zoom in and let it load, and you'll see it. This is called Missouri Triangle in the Lost Hills here. Let's just show you. Not these over here. All of these. They, they start to look like ants on the ground. It's not a jack or a pump storage yard either. These are all drill points, guys. And look how many there are. All the way back up to here. And beyond, and we just keep going and going and going and going. 
back up to the spot that I just showed you up here. Kalinga. San Andreas. Right along it. You can literally see the sand, the break of the San Andreas. Now, they come so close with the drill points that it gets insane. What I would call insane overdrive drill points next to the San Andreas. Sure, they'll use the excuse of getting oil out of the ground. But I think somebody knows or knew what I know now. That there's a flow of energy that goes across to these areas. And they perforated out of this so that they could divert the flow from the San Andreas over to the valley and over to Ridgecrest. The Garlock transfer flow from here to here. And the USGS put out some studies a few years ago. A very nice uh, woman researcher who was dipping a lot of time and effort into studying this area from Colinga, or I'm sorry, from Kettleman City, which is right next to Colinga, all the way down here to Bakersfield. And look what's at Bakersfield. Wait for it to load, but check it out. These are all oil wells too, tens of thousands. So a researcher studied a huge, isn't this insane? Look at that. A huge subsidence that has started to take place over the last 40 years here in southern part of the valley, San Joaquin Valley, from up here, across diagonally, down to Bakersfield. And everywhere south of there, right down to the mountain range, has subsided or sank up to 40 feet the whole region, the roads, the bridges, the houses, everything, the farm fields, everything together sinking down. They call it severe subsidence. And for the USGS to use the word severe at all on anything is a pretty big deal. But anyway, they attributed it to the loss of groundwater. <laughs> and at the conference, some guy in all black gets up to ask a question at the end. He's like my hero or something. This guy gets up and asks a question about the oil wells, and they totally are like... They literally, a, a, a moderator from the back of the room chimes in and shuts the guy up from asking about the oil wells and the depletion of oil through here that could cause the subsidence, not the water. Anyway, the drill points, guys. The drill points. Let's take a look. We go down to them, jump over to them. Then down here, we pick back up at the south tip of the valley with the exact same size quake so far. The only thing missing is a new 3.2. But, I mean, exact same size compared to the rest that jumped over into the valley. Now look, a diagonal line coming down the coast, swarming up at the volcano to the north. Then we have the creeping section creeping pretty heavy, jumping over into the valley. Look what's going on at the California-Nevada border. Check it out. Oh, and over in Utah. Notice in Utah, if you played the game of connect the dots, it would make a line like this, going northwest to southeast, or southeast to northwest. Right out here at the tip, 100,000 drill points, oil and gas. I can show it to you in a minute, but look at the line. Look at the way it's going, the direction. Okay. Compare that to the line of earthquakes along the coast and compare that to the line of earthquakes along the California-Nevada border. All three are going in the same direction. They're pointing back up here. So up here is where the tension's coming from, where we don't have any earthquakes reported at all, where they go weeks and weeks and months and months without reporting anything of any significance, even though, come on, they're doing that for your guys' comfort. You know what I mean? They don't want you to see fours and fives out here out off the coast. Or sixes. So you don't have any. You know what I mean? But meanwhile, then, after those hit, of course, they are out there. They're just not reporting them. Then coming in on land, everybody's like, where did this flow come from? Why, why a sudden swarming and all this other stuff going on? Because uh, out in the ocean, there's something going on. Now, we're looking for a 5.9 out here in the ocean. But how many years has it been since there's been a six? Oh, you mean the last one that got reported was right when I got into the big debate with the people who run the network up here? That was the last? That was like seven years ago, man. I guess earthquakes just stopped off the West Coast, you know. No big deal, you know. Anyway, even if they don't report them out in the ocean, we'll still see the flow coming on land, all those fours that I'm looking for. We're right on the threshold of it. Look along the California-Nevada border. Another 3.2 to 3.3. Now, wait a second. That's two of them. Two of the exact same-sized earthquakes. One down along the coast, following the red line of the San Andreas. I already showed it to you. But what about this one? Why is this striking up here between Lake Tahoe and Pyramid Lake? What would you do if I told you that there, was, there is an undiscovered supervolcano there? And it took 
me, and few of my viewers, but mainly me, to notice a bunch of earthquakes there, which then prompted me to do this. Take the coordinates for small earthquakes, zeros, ones, twos, and threes, and go look and see what's there. And when you zoom in and you see a giant oval shape that's lined with other volcanoes with two basins on either side and a marked geothermal field called Steamboat Springs that they're drilling the hell out of to get steam for these turbines that are here if they'll load. Again, I can't believe it, guys. I'm on MustNet. I'm on Starlink. Come on, man. Google's blocking this shit. So up here on the north side, let me show you. Lake Tahoe, Steamboat Springs. Lake Tahoe Basin, geothermal field. Giant oval surrounded with volcanoes. Another basin. And then another geothermal field. The needles at Pyramid Lake here. At Wizard's Cove, Monument Rock. These are all large tufa deposits. Tufa, tufa calcium carbonate deposits that build up like a geyser field and what well, is a geyser field and i again it's like a ridiculous amount of slowdown going on here just to prevent me from being able to show anything i'm telling you i am being slowed down we'll go do a speed test if you don't believe me all right so oh by the way i've been shut off online and i can't stream new world order came after me and nobody believed it until after i got shut down yeah right you remember Anyway, here I am now, and I can't even maintain a connection. I'm on my wife's computer because I got hacked last week, and all the compu- all my computers got destroyed, bricked. So I'm on somebody else's computer now. Anyway, here we are. Giant oval shape. That's a super volcano, Caldera. Now, what led my eye to it, to discover it, were the earthquakes that struck all the way around the outside edge, and then the fires that broke around all the way around the outside edge. All of those Things drew my eye to it first before I even surmised that this giant oval shape with two basins and two geyser fields and earthquakes and volcanoes around it is just like this. The one that the professionals admit exists. Only it's smaller. The the one to the south, the one they admit exists, is smaller. That's Long Valley Caldera. It gets hit with earthquakes all the way around the outside edge. It's lined with its own volcanoes. And it has two geothermal fields on either side. And it has two basins on either side. One is Mono Lake. The other is the basin that goes down at Bishop into Death Valley. One flows out, basically. The other fills up. But two basins on either side. Geothermal fields on either side. Lined with volcanoes. Hit with earthquakes around the outside edge. Super volcano confirmed with 1,000 cubic kilometers of meltdown below it. This one up here, I defined on my own. And I'm still talking about it to this day with no acknowledgement from anyone. Meanwhile, this just happened next to it. Same-sized earthquake that struck on the freaking San Andreas. So, the volcano, the super volcano there is getting hit, just for the same reason that Mount St. Helens is getting hit, and Mount Rainier is getting hit. Now, what about the lone earthquake out here in the middle of Oregon? A zero. A nothing quake. I guess it's just a no... Actually, look, it's a negative earthquake. Sucking in energy. Got a... A portal opening down below. And look, it's a negative depth, too. Up in the sky. (laughs) No, okay, here's the deal, guys. When you get a negative depth earthquake, it's usually up inside of a mountain, up above sea level. So it's actually technically true up in the sky, but it's up in a mountain up in the sky. Right here. See these? The mountains are lined with trees. I could turn it at an angle, but it's not like it's going to (laughs) load. Anyway, here's Newberry Crater. And we are lined with mountains all the way around it. We're up inside of the mountain, right outside of the volcanic complex itself. Newberry Crater, pretty impressive. Glass flows, type of lava. Obsidian Crater, look at that, that's cool. On both sides, that flowed down and into these two basins, again, two basins on either side of Newberry Crater. Well, our earthquakes are coming in next to this. What's this? Hold on. What's that? Hold on. I'll wait all day. Uh Uh-oh. Oh, Oh, shit. Okay. We got a retention pond. We got a pad. We got a pipeline. Going to it. To pull water off. Oh, no. Hold on. 
Hold on. Please, guys. No. No, 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 no. No! Hold on. Got to make sure before I say anything. This is where a fast internet connection would really would help at this point. All the waiting, all the suspense. What are we clearing these big pads for? I guarantee you it's not forestry. Not with the pipes and the ponds. Ah, right in the middle. Damn it. Okay, let's go see what's going on. Wait for it to load a little bit more. Well, I'll tell you what. Not liking the look of this. Up on a mound. We got the cleared pads. We got the pipe. Where is this going? Not for forestry. Nothing on that one. Okay, all right. Well, I'm going to lean towards geothermal. What's this one down here? It's got water in it. I'm going to lean towards their collecting water to then inject into the ground to generate steam. Then it's taken by pipeline to some geothermal plant around here that I'm just not going to see because of literally I'm on a fax machine to get my freaking information. I cracked that joke last time, but... Psst. I can't believe it, dude. Yep. There you go. Tank and pipeline and everything. All right, now it's not too big of a shock. The earthquake is coming in on the edge of a geothermal pumping operation, which is on the edge of one of these basins. Now you see the other lava flows and craters up here on the north side. These are not forest fire locations. All this, these dark rocky areas are old lava flows. And you see the craters. You see how many there are? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. These are all volcanoes, every single one of these little craters here. One, two, three, four. I mean, we're up to like 10 or 15 or 20 of these. See, Kelsey Butte up there, that's one. And again, these are raised up. Now, this looks like they did some clear cutting there. Clear cutting on the side of that volcano, probably geothermal exploration. They replant. Now, this thing's pretty cool. This and this. Everybody missed it, by the way. Everybody missed that. And they all missed this one up here, too. This one. Everybody missed this. Everybody missed this. And the volcanoes all around it. You see the craters. And everybody missed this. With the volcanoes right in the middle of it. I don't know what to call them. We can, I can name them, I guess. There are no names for this. It's like this giant caldera here. It's obviously part of the Snake River Plain here that connects over to Yellowstone. Connects back up like a giant smiley face. And this is a, probably the first blast point. There's probably several other blast points that go down and around and come back up to Yellowstone. Either that or they're both just tied like this across and that this is a super volcano location as well, 100%. Stand by it. This is a bulging lacolith. A bulge in the plate from magma rises up to the center. Goes down on both sides. This is bulging up to the center. You can even see it from above where it's cracking on the sides. And how that's doming. Crack in the ground, State Park. Yeah, I bet. Okay, anyway, uh, let's back that out. That's the earthquake in Oregon. Going down across the California border over right next to Mount Shasta. Just east by southeast of it. Small activity, but my eye is drawn to the California-Nevada border where we go down along through Nevada. We go out to Monte Cristo Hills, Volcanic Buttes, down to Long Valley Caldera, and then you'll see clusters of earthquakes down here to the south. More rare. Should we go look them up? Let's do it. Go put the coordinates in over at Beatty, Nevada. What's over at Beatty? Anybody know? <laughs> New viewers, your mind is about to explode. Literally, when you see what I'm about to show you. So why would there be a bunch of earthquakes out here in South Nevada? Wonder what could be there. What are those? See all these little pads on the ground? We're not doing uh, oil here, guys. These are the nuke test sites from the 1980s and 1990s let me turn on let's see our google earth community we let the europeans come over here and do some tests 
France and the UK. But then we did them too, of course, with them. Uh, let's find here. U.S. Nuke Operation Delamar. 150 kilotons on April 18th, 1987. Now, what happens when you detonate nuclear weapons underground is it creates man-made faults that spread out miles in all directions. Now, look how many times they did the nukes here. Every one of these craters and every one of these letter I's is a different nuke test. All the way down to the south, where they did them at the surface and blew away the towns that they built to see what would happen when you blow away a town. You saw the recreation of that in the Indiana Jones movie, by the way. But anyway, up here, we're right next to it. Come on, we're right next to the nuke sites. And they actually go down here to the south. They're not all marked. I don't think they are. Yeah, they're not. They certainly are not all marked. Google Earth community still has to mark some, but I would think that maybe some of these down here, like right here, are sites. But I can't. Again, I will wait for it to load. So nuke test sites are getting hit out there. They are not doing nukes there now. Don't worry. So we would see a lot bigger seismic, but we're going up to near three there. Let's recap. Three over along the San Andreas. Three coming down the California-Nevada border. Three or 2.8, 2.9 plus a little swarm at the nuke sites. Then down here by Las Vegas. Pretty weird. Pretty rare. Let's go see what's going on. Now notice they have it just listed as Nevada. It's right, literally right next to Las Vegas. It should be triangulated from the nearest big down. It should say Las Vegas, Nevada, right outside or whatever, 22 kilometers east of Las Vegas. It should say that. Somebody's probably paying some huge money. Tourists get scared away when they hear about earthquake, even if they're small. So don't tell the tourists. That's okay. I won't. You won't. And if you're going, just go have a good time. Because, you know, small earthquakes aren't going to hurt anybody anyways. Hashtag Tartaria. Look what we got going on out here. A giant quarry out in the middle of the desert by the giant solar arrays that they're using to now power Las Vegas. So, where do we want to lend towards the earthquake being the... What's the cause, right? Well, the power lines are right here. Wait for it to load. But the power lines are giant towers that the solar panels there feed into. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I fell asleep while I was waiting for this freaking internet to connect through. Sorry. Hey, you know, you ever have a teacher that falls asleep in class? In the fourth grade, we had a fourth grade teacher. He fell asleep in class all the time. Anyway, solar array going over to the power lines. The earthquake's right between the quarry, the solar array, the power lines. I'm going to tell you something about the power lines that nobody's going to believe, but I will be eventually proved right on at some point in the future. The power companies put the power lines over certain locations where power flows out of the ground. You know, electricity flows negative to positive, right? Right? You know it flows negative. You know the, the ground is negative and the sky is positive, right? And you know that Benjamin Franklin flew a kite at a certain height and he was able to pull some electricity static out of the air. And if there's a lightning storm, of course, you get electrocuted. But on a regular day, you pull some electricity out of the sky by flying the kite and light up the key or get a little, a little voltage come down the wire. Well, I think the power companies figured that out a while ago. And that's why they built the power lines over all the megalithic monuments. Why they put big microwave towers next to the pyramids. Why they built power lines along the Trail of Tears and uh, stuff like this. Collect the energy and sell it back to the public. Of course, they transform it into something you can use in your house. But anyway, the solar arrays are right there, right next to the quarry. And the quarry is a whole nother story. And I just made a rhyme. Now let's get out of here. And I am going to be doing some videos on this in the future about the ancient civilization that used to be here. That's 100% confirmed used to be here. And we were all not told about it. It has nothing to do with the American Indians. Like before the American Indians. So sometime in the mid-thousands, it wasn't Indians. <laughs>
Oh, man, the world's a weird place. Anyway, looking back over to the quakes, going down along the coast, we jump over to the drill points. Going down along the border, we jump over to the power lines, the power generation facilities, and the volcanoes. Once we get down to Southern California, I'd like to point out that a few events have taken place over the past few days that are troubling to me. Major shaking was reported across the LA basin and it got reported in as like a two or something. Felt reports, like 500 felt reports came in at once. I, I don't know what's going on, but it's gone completely quiet down in Southern California. So let's just go with it and say that it's a natural occurrence instead of somebody hitting an off switch. Let's just say it really has went from noticeable activity down south to next to nothing down south. That would be like cutting off the flow. And if you're going to cut off the flow on a big river, guess what happens when you cut off the flow on a big river? It starts to dam up and try to flow around. Look what's happening. It's trying to flow around. Hence the earthquakes going in a line across Utah, heading over towards the edge of of the North American Craton. That brings us down to Texas. So, this update so far is covered pretty much everywhere around the planet, right? I mean, basically. And let's look over to Texas. Look what's going on. What size struck over in Texas? Well, I'll be the exact same size. 3.0, 2.9, 2.8, three-ish range, so we're dealing with 3.2, 3.3, 2.9, 2.9 out off the West Coast. We're dealing with 2.9, 3.0, 3.0, somewhere in that range on the edge of the Craton over to the east. So edge of the Craton to the east, Texas, hit with the same sized earthquakes flowing across the plate at this moment, which is in the three-ish range. I'm looking for it to go up a whole magnitude from where we are now, maybe even a magnitude and a half. 4.5 to 4.9 on the West Coast, 4.0 in Texas, Upper three and swarm over on the East Coast. East Coast, West Virginia. So West Virginia over here on the East Coast of the United States. And we're all set up for it to happen. If you look at the halfway point between the previous earthquakes over the past several days, well, going back to last week, West Virginia standing out, going into Virginia itself, but I issued the warning for West Virginia. Georgia even got hit. Small earthquake in the middle of central Georgia on the edge of the Craton East right on the east no, southeast edge. New Madrid moving, and it's all the same size. It's a stepping stone path of twos going across the Craton once we get to Texas at the drill points in Texas. By the way, all those locations in Texas are drill points. So every location in Texas and Oklahoma that's being struck, every single one in Texas and Oklahoma being struck is at a drill point. Up in Kansas, the lone quake up here in Kansas, at a 1950s oil pumping operation that was capped off many years ago, but the drill points are still there. Natoma, Kansas, five kilometer depth. And I already know that because we looked it up previously when a previous earthquake struck at or right next to this location. And uh, you can go pull the Kansas oil well information. I'm not going to waste your time showing you a one or a two um, at a 1950s pumping operation because literally it's an open field. There's nothing there. You have to look it up on the state map. Okay, now back to it, back to the quakes. Everything else, like I said, all the way across Oklahoma, all the way across Texas. Every single quake, oil pumping operation. Do I need to prove that to you? I don't think so. You guys can go look it up if you need to. Over to the east, we get to the New Madrid Seismic Zone, and there are no drill points here. Right in South Missouri, and we are at actually no drill points there in Arkansas either. The nearest drill points are about 40 miles away so we're talking about far enough distance, I wouldn't think the drill points would matter. So two different twos striking across the New Madrid, somewhat equally spaced through the center of it. So what's really going on is threes going down to Texas, twos going across the middle of the drill points across Oklahoma, Kansas, twos going over to the New Madrid, twos going down to Georgia. Next step, the halfway point between the previous earthquakes, East Coast. The whole plate's moving, and I'm going to turn off the magnitudes. I want everybody to look at the screen now. Please take a look at the screen. We're going to turn off the rings, turn off our magnitudes. Here's the craton. One more time, make sure you can see that. Here's our earthquakes without the magnitudes tied to them. And here's the last seven days. Notice 
over on the west coast it's almost like a ring of quakes going right out to the edge of the great time over in utah 100,000 drill points in eastern utah i shouldn't need to show those to you either same with down in southern colorado i shouldn't need to show you the hundreds of thousands of drill points in southern colorado where this earthquake is you can go look those up if you're enterprising individuals and get the coordinates from the usgs if you need to be shown because you're a new person I would entertain the idea of doing it. Do I need to show? Do I need to show the new people what 100,000 drill points looks like so they don't question me ever again on this? Because there's going to be somebody out there who's like, "Wow, look at this! USGS just listing it as Utah. They listed this one. It just as they do this for the earthquakes. I think they want to hide. Like what's there? They're, I can't believe it. That's weird. Okay." Has anybody ever seen them do that for multiple quakes? All right. What's at the location? Mountains. Beautiful mountains of northern eastern Utah, right? Well, all of this through Carbon County on the west side, going to the north side, right over to right about here where it says East Carbon, drilled. And I'm going to wait for it to load. But you should already be able to start to make out the little white pads on the ground even without it loading. Now that you know what a blotch looks like. Uh, now you know what a censorship blotch looks like. You should be able to identify an oil well very easily. So you see the jack and the pump that's there and the shadow of the jack and the pump and so forth. That's just one pad. Now we go from there down to the east-southeast ever so slightly. There's a few more. But once you get over here, you go through the mountains the wells carry on through the mountains and then over here on this side it's insane well first of all do you see it <laughs> uh, of course you don't see it it's not loading they look like little dots on the ground these are all drill points every single one of them you may have to full screen it to see, but they go up here through the river valley, through the mountains, back down across. I already showed it to you through the mountains. But you start to make them out through the valleys here, and they look like a grid on the ground. You see them all now? Those are all drill points. We go over the hills and through the fields, and we have more and more and more going through the farm fields across this way. Through the green fields, you see the little square pads. Those are not houses. And then we get into something that's just insane. Where if you thought that was a lot, that's nothing in comparison to what's getting ready to load here on the screen. Now, on the screen now are a bunch of haphazardly placed drill points that are not in a grid, but they look like sand dunes or some kind of natural feature because of their number, the amount of drill points that are here. And at this point, it's asinine, it's not loading. You see him now? Okay. And I'm not going to keep complaining about the load, but I've never had this problem before. Seriously. In, in like all my years of streaming. So either MustNet is not capable at all. It's on, it's on top of my roof. Or I'm being censored. And I'm leaning towards censorship. All right. Now, finally, let's just wrap this up. Why would I get censored? Well... Turns out, professionals said, there was no flow of earthquakes going around the planet or across the North American Grey Dawn. And when I tried to show them, a huge public campaign was led by a few professors to get me taken down, shut down my financing and my fundraisers, maybe even get me put in jail, they said. Because they said what I was doing should be illegal. Now, here we are, and there's a flow going across the plate. It's undeniable. They were wrong. They were wrong to do what they did, and they were wrong about the science, too. There is a flow going across the plates. It matters because now we can forecast based upon the flow, like a river or a flood. Let's go back to the start of the update. Speaking of floods. We're flooded with seismic energy in the West Pacific. No duh, right? Multiple large earthquakes over the past week, including fatalities in China with a 6.6. 
6.5, 6.4 strike in Indo Indonesia, and a 7.6 devastating quake over in Papua New Guinea. Europe is moving. The Mideast is moving. It's all moving on a 4 to 5.0 basis. We're about a one magnitude under what I'm expecting right now. I hope it stays like that through the rest of the week, and I'm wrong by a magnitude. That would mean a 4.9 would come in on the West Coast, and 3.9s would strike through California. I mean, what's the difference? One will knock things off shelves. The other will actually cause some slight damage. The difference between a 5 or a 4.9 and a 3.9. Again, 3.9 might knock a few things off shelves, wake you up. A 4.9 to 5 actually can cause some damage. That's the difference. So it matters. This all goes back to the core of the Earth and what's going on down below the plates overall. How are there deep earthquakes coming up from down below where there's no Earth to quake? In the magma, the asthenosphere, down below the plates, the melted area. How could there be earthquakes down there? Well, looks like there's a vibrating wave coming up and hitting the underside of the plates. Coming up from the core of the Earth, which is vibrating like a giant bass speaker. But it's plasma, electroplasma, fed by power from the sun. Think of a blowtorch, a plasma torch, and some kind of factory cutting through almost any material, but a million trillion times more powerful. Well, how about that for some math? A billion times more. Billions and billions of, whatever, times more powerful and rotating physically and capable of vaporizing all the elements, especially the heaviest elements that sink down the most once they're molten. So like molten iron, molten nickel, molten uranium, then gets vaporized like it's a plasma globe that you touch your hands to and touch the glass and see the little tendrils come out and touch your fingers. Ooh, pretty electric flowing through neon gas. Well, the same thing would be happening down in the core of the earth and that that electricity then flows up, out, and away from the core of the earth, which we know it does because guess what? Lightning comes up out of the ground, goes up in the sky. Turns out there's electricity in the ground flowing through the ground, and it can come up into the sky when there's a great enough charge and a differential between the sky and the ground. Well, that electricity is coming up from the core. And that's what's causing earthquakes, not the lightning, but a flow of some kind of very low frequency, which is electrical in nature, flowing through the plates. And that's what's hitting the underside of the plates coming up, I think. So, I think... Because these are all things that were said to be impossible up until I proved that there was a progression, which I did. Not faking earthquakes and not trying to make it look like there's a progression. Those were the claims. I've refuted and debunked those claims. There is a flow of earthquakes going across the plates. Everybody can see it on the freaking screen. If you can't, I just showed you. And it does it every week this way. Sorry, I get all fired up about this. But these are big discoveries. And somebody in the future who actually has a brain... You know, it's not like I'm some super genius. Somebody who's actually smart will actually refine this down to a very fine point where I can get it down to a region in a week and within a magnitude, they'll be able to get it down to a day in a location a few dozen miles apart and uh, across and get it down to within a hair of a point someday. It'll be like weather, weather forecasting, but better because I think we can detect this wave. And that goes over to my member page. If you want to go see my invention idea, you have to become a member. It's not like I'm going to give it away for free. It's going to cost you five bucks. <laughs> oh, you want an invention to save the world? Nah, five bucks. It's not going to save the world, but it's a good idea for an invention. If somebody wants to go over and read it and make it, you can. I very seriously doubt I have the gumption or the willpower or the time to make a new kind of seismometer to detect this VLF, ULF, ELF wave traveling through the plates. I'll leave that up to the eggheads who need financing and want to get a doctorate degree in something. I got my doctorate in online. That's enough for me. <laughs> School of hard knocks, you know. All right, guys. Do you have an earthquake plan? Black screen. Pay attention. Do you have an earthquake plan? It's just basic stuff. You're supposed to take shelter underneath a table or a desk. But I would suggest having the emergency kit prepared. Dust off the emergency kit, please. If you don't have one, you're going to need to make one. It's a bag that you put stuff in that has stuff in it that you need when a disaster happens. It's basic stuff, but hardly anybody does it. I don't know why either. Seriously, it's so basic. You put a change of clothes, set of shoes, some granola bars, a few fruit roll-ups, pocket knife, and a few other things that are going to come in handy when you're shit out of luck and power's out. You're going to probably need a little 
Oh, I just said a bad word. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. You're going to need the solar panel. You're going to need the batteries. You're going to need blah, blah, blah. Food and water. The water is going to be the most heavy thing, most likely, that you're carrying. Seven pounds a gallon or something. You could get the water pump. So maybe that's a good idea. Those are expensive. Finding a cheap one. I don't know. They're not even really out there. Good ones are a couple hundred bucks at least. But anyway, food and water, clothes, you can take care of that stuff. Have it in a bag ready to go and change it out twice a year. So you have your winter and your summer. Or if you live in a warm area, then just make sure to update the batteries and update the food every once in a while in there. I'm just reminding you, you should already have this stuff. Extra set of car keys, extra documents to get your IDs done. For crying out loud, man, do it. All right. Anyway, I'm not going to harp on you. You should just do it just for yourself. If not for yourself, then the people in your house or your, the people you'll work with, you might happen at work. Do you have something taken care of at work? Why not have a separate little emergency kit you keep at work? And one at home or one in the car if you have a car. And just little ideas. I don't know. Anyway, it gets annoying after a while. I get it. Word up and much love. I'm going to upload this over to YouTube. We will watch it back in a premiere. Welcome to all the new members over on YouTube. That does financially compensate me. Thank you. There's over 100 of you now in a day. So if we keep that up, 100 a day, that'll be awesome. Anyway, it's an option. Word up. Peace out.